Okay, we got to keep powering along. So Stephen Koch, pioneer, snowboard mountaineer, went looking to summit the seven summits on seven continents and discovered the powerful grip of great purpose. Stephen. Thank you. I think we're going to play a short video and then I'll be back out. Ah. <laughs> For me, after climbing a mountain, it's just the beginning because that's when I, I get to do what I came to do. You want to climb what everyone agrees is the most dangerous and scariest mountain in the world and then snowboard down. Why? I've been thinking about this for 10 years and this is the eve of the real attempt. Making turns at 8,850 meters without oxygen is going to be a real challenge. As soon as the avalanche came in, I was on my back. It just took me right out. Calling from the north face of Everest, Stephen Koch, Jimmy Chin, Lakpa Sherpa, and Kami Sherpa have all departed to start their ascent of the Japanese Kuar. All right, thank you. Pleasure. If we could start that PowerPoint, that'd be great. Pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I'm the Stephen that Wade Davis was talking about. You know, I just had never experienced the kind of kindness and niceness that everyone says when you bump into them around here. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. It was like, wow. And I guess I'm a kind of a typical American. I've been calling this place Toronto for, you know, the whole time until someone said, uh, it's, it's Toronto. I'm like, well, why does it have a T in it? Um, so uh, snowboard mountaineering is what has been my passion for most of my adult life. And it's, that's a term that I coined, and it is just what it is. It's snowboarding and mountaineering combined. So it's climbing up mountains, carrying my snowboard and the equipment needed, and then getting to the highest point, usually the summit ideally, and snowboarding down. And I want to back up a little bit to just let you know, I grew up in a family like many, well, everyone here had a family, I had parents. I'm the fourth of five kids and upper middle class upbringing, and I love team sports, but uh, I was born different in a sense. I was born without a right pectoral muscle and they didn't even know it until I was, you know, a couple months old. And I got into soccer and loved team sports until it was time to take team showers. And then I, I was a little insecure, a lot insecure about it and the teasing that I experienced. So that's when I got into to skateboarding because showers were not needed for skateboarding. They were actually frowned upon. <laughs> And, and skateboarding led to, it was something I could do alone. 
and I could do anywhere. I moved to Denver and then to Boston, and I wanted to get back to the mountains. I'd skied a little bit. Any skiers, snowboarders here? Yeah, it's a pretty fun thing. I did it a little bit growing up when I lived in Denver, and from the East Coast in Boston, I wasn't ready to go to college, so instead I moved to Jackson Hole to take a year off. And the Teton Mountains are amazing. They're the most beautiful place I know now. But I was drawn there because of these high mountains and for this new sport of snowboarding. And I became passionate about it. I moved there with a one-way plane ticket, knowing nobody. And I'm literally, you know, got a suitcase, and I'm hitchhiking to town off the airplane, get a ride, go to the job fair, get a job, get the season ski pass. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in Jackson Hole, I'm snowboarding. And I went uh, from literally the bunny slopes to the expert shoots in a matter of a week. And I found this sport that I was totally in love with. And I'd never experienced the kind of connection that I, that I did with snowboarding, sliding on snow, just the freedom of moving over snow. And my first job was baking cookies. This is one that I actually baked. <laughs> and Corbett's Kuwar is one of the more radical extreme runs in the country and in, in the world, actually. It usually requires about a you know, five meter drop airborne until you hit the rut. And then you take a sharp right and you try and miss the rock wall there. It's more convenient to be on a snowboard than skis for the reason that when you crash in Tomahawk, you don't yard sail because you keep all your gear on you. <laughs> Occasionally, your goggles fly off. So this is, uh, the equipment was pretty rudimentary. This is in 1987, 88, uh, in 89, I switched to two-buckle rental ski boots and used this, this board. This is next to Corbett's Kuwar. This is about a seven or eight meter drop or 10, 12, or excuse me, 22 feet foot drop down in s and s Kuwar. And I found my passion, I found my people. I was connected to the world in a way that I never had been before through this sport of snowboarding. And I was like, what's the next thing I can do? I just was chomping at the bit. I was snowboarding every moment I could that I was not working, which was as little as possible. It did not matter that I was sleeping on a couch with friends and I was living on ramen noodles. Those are details. When you're passionate about what you're doing, that's all that matters. And I was snowboarding all the time and I became really good. But I knew I wanted to snowboard in the high Teton peaks. They'd never been snowboarded. I was there at a time where I could actually be a pioneer. And I set out to climb and snowboard the highest of the Teton peaks, the Grand Teton. But I knew I didn't have the skills to get up. I knew I had the skills and ability to get down. So what I did was I reached out for a mentor and I found one. And Finding a mentor is something that changed my life. It allowed me to really pursue my dreams on a whole nother level. So I found this mentor, Tom Turiano, and he taught me the ropes and the tools to use, the tools of mountaineering, the ice axe and the crampons, and the rope, which is the lifeline of climbers, and how to use that. But I also had to learn about something more important, and that's safety and trust. And this trust was not simply about the equipment and about learning the weather and when to go and not go. It was more about communication and dealing with a partner on a whole new level when your life is literally in their hands through the rope. But taking it a step further, I had to learn to trust myself so that I could be the partner that I wanted them to be for me. And that was a challenge for me. I grew up with a parent who was fairly critical. And trust was something I did not do easily. I put up walls when I was young to protect myself because I was wounded. I was put down. You're not good enough. And I had to work through that. 
and I was, it was really a conscious challenge. I knew, wow, to be the mountaineer that I know I need to be for my partners, I need to get through these, these walls that I put up around myself, around my heart. And I did that, and I worked through that with partnerships, through rage, through anger, through trusting others, and eventually learned how to trust myself. And then I could be the partner that I knew I needed to be in order to take things to another level. And I did that on the Grand Teton, which was first skied in 1971 by Bill Briggs, who he skied it with a fused hip. He walks with this really pronounced limp, and he sits leaning because he can't sit straight, and he rides a bike with this limp, but he can make ski turns. So when he had his hip fused at a 45-degree angle, he obviously had his priorities straight. <laughs> So I went out there with, with my two partners, and we set out to climb up. This was when you couldn't go into to MEC or REI and buy one of 10 backpacks that carry snowboards. This was when there were mountaineering backpacks, and you just lashed on your skis. So I got a bungee cord with my mountaineering pack, and I lashed it on and said, yeah, this will work. You know, it's a little floppy, but but it'll work, and I'm going to go for it. And this has to work, because my drive and my passion is to climb this mountain and snowboard down. And, and one way to really reduce the risk, because people say, wow, this is really dangerous what you're doing. A great way to reduce the risk in the mountain world is to climb up what I'm going to descend. That way I know intimately the snow, the conditions. Is there ice there? Are there rocks? Are there things I need to know about to avoid on the descent? Some of the m most skiers and snowboarders who die in the mountains, it's in the high mountains, it's uh, not climbing up what they go down. All these people with helicopters getting dropped off, they don't know intimately the snow slope. So that's one way to reduce that risk. Always trying to reduce the risk. So I made the first snowboard descent. And this scared little child was thrilled to be on the cover of the newspaper in Jackson Hole. We actually had two of them back then. And uh, it was a good week for me, the 20-year-old on the cover of the paper, made the first snowboard descent. But I was like, what's next? And I did not have a fashion mentor, obviously, <laughs> and could have used one. But I said, I want to step outside of my comfort zone. I want to take things one step further. And that is, I can snowboard steep things at moderate elevation, but I want to go high. I want to go to a high mountain and snowboard down, see if I can do that, challenge myself for that. And I picked Aconcagua, the highest mountain outside of the Himalaya. And I went there, and I had an epic four-day storm, got frostbite, barely survived, went back the next year, succeeded, then went to Denali, was being drawn to the high mountains around the world, read this book by Dick Bass called The Seven Summits about him being guided on them as the first mountaineer to climb them. And I said, wow, is it possible? Is it even possible to snowboard these mountains, the highest mountains around the world? And I said, yes, I think it is. Karsten's Pyramid might be a bit problematic. It's granite, or excuse me, it's limestone. But those are minor details. We'll figure that out along the way. And I set this goal to snowboard the seven summits. And along the way, after doing a few of them, I was training on Mount Owen in the Tetons. It's the second highest of the Teton peaks. It had never been skied or snowboarded, this face, the northeast snowfields. Beautiful. 5,000 feet. I set out to do it alone. I'm climbing up. It's getting warm, I say, to heck with turning around. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to be on the cover of the paper again. That little boy will feel great being on the cover of the paper. It was ego-driven, ego-driven, not logical, going for the wrong reasons, you could argue. But I kept going, and then I heard a noise above me, and I thought, oh, it's a jet airplane. I'm like, that's cool. 
And then I saw a plume of snow, and I said, oh, no, that's not a jet airplane. That's not cool. And a few seconds later, I see a wall of white shoot over the ridge above me and hits me in my chest, knocks me on my back, literally on my back, snowboarding down this couloir, thinking this is so wrong. <laughs> and then I start tumbling out of control, and I feel great pain in my knee and hear a noise like a rubber band popping as my ligaments are tearing. A few seconds later, bam, the other knee. I'm like, this has got to stop. I'm going to be dead. <laughs> and then it gets quiet. I'm like, yes, it's done. It's over. And I realize I'm launching in the air over a cliff. And I crash land and feel great pain in my back, still conscious, unfortunately. <laughs> and I'm like, I gotta stop. So I claw at the snow with my hands and kick with my toes to stop. And I, I see something out of the corner of my eye. And when I realized what it was, I was horrified. It was my lower right leg just off to the side, and I thought to myself, yeah, that is so wrong. <laughs> and, and I'm still conscious, but I'm slowing down and stopping. The tail end of the avalanche comes, and it fills my mouth and throat up with snow. I'm stopped on the slope. I can't breathe. <laughs> oh, I cough as hard as I can. I get this plug of snow out. I'm able to breathe. <sighs> I do a quick body check. I'm like, okay, right knee fucked, <laughs> left knee hurts, neck hurts, ribs hurt, shoulders hurt, but uh, right knee. I actually spoke to orthopedic surgeons and they concurred that when you're experiencing a dislocated knee, that that is the correct term. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I knew I had to get out of the way. I was going to have more avalanches come. So I moved out of the way with my one ice axe, my pack and everything else is gone. And once I'm off to the side, I turn around and I see more avalanches come and I'm just holding my knee sitting on the snow going, please just don't hit my knee. Just don't hit my knee. And these avalanches came and, and missed me. A few hit me in the sides, but I didn't get knocked over. The next, I slid down the snow several hundred feet, did the backstroke, kicking with my good leg. It only had a torn ACL. <laughs> and then I was like, I got to survive the night. My teeth started chattering. I thought, no, no, this is the beginning of the night. I'm injured. I'm alone. I have no warm clothes, no shelter. What can I do? And I thought, oh, I can breathe. breathe. I can breathe fast, and that'll get the blood flowing in my body. So I took my climbing harness off. I balled it up. I sat on it for a little insulation from the snow, and I just held myself. I held the scared little boy who thought he might die, and I was, <sighs> and then my back hurt, and I sat up, and I was like, oh, I'd twist it because that felt better. I didn't know it was broken, <laughs> and then I <I'd> <sighs> And all night long I'm doing this, and the songs that came in my head were unbelievable. I never knew I was such a classic rock guy. There's a, <laughs> Waiting for the Sun by the Doors. Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. So anyway, in the morning, I, I heard a helicopter. And it landed, and I heard the footsteps of the climbing rangers get louder and louder. And finally I saw them come into view, and I looked at them, and they looked at me, and they said, I'm glad to see you. And I looked at them and said, yeah, I'm glad to see you too. And I relaxed and I just started shaking out of control. And they put me on the backboard, flew me to the hospital in Jackson, Wyoming. I'm in the hospital getting hot blankets from hot nurses. I'm like, life is good right now. <laughs> so I ended up going back to Mount Owen a year later after four knee surgeries, intensive rehab, with a partner, the right avalanche equipment, checking the forecast, being willing to turn around. It took two more tries. And I climbed up and made the first descent of the Northeast snowfields. And it really felt great to get back on 
the horse, so to speak, and to complete that. And I just want to let you know that, you know, when the chips are down, you can work through them when you believe anything is possible, as you've seen countless times with the speakers on this stage. And that the passion that we all have inside, the gold that we all have inside, is what makes us magic. We are magic, every single one of us. And sharing that with others when you have it and tapping into your own magic is what sets us free. So thank you so much. Sorry, I screwed that up. Screwed it up. No problem. Forgot thank it. You. Makes no difference there. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you.